Hello and welcome everybody to this talk about the end of the time. Uh, my name is Arndt Bergman. And this is one of my side projects that I've been working on for the past six years, hoping to get it done by the end of the year since I started. And we'll see which, end, which, which year that will be. Um, no. If necessary, I can talk a bit more about why we're doing all this work. I don't know how many of you have seen the same talk when I was here a couple of years ago. Can you just raise your hands? That's a few of them. I'll probably get into all the background before we dive deep into the code and what we've done since then. Um, the basic problem is that there's a type called time t, which is fundamental to all Unix systems. It counts the seconds since 1970. And that means that in the beginning of 2038, it will overflow. And since it's a signed type, it will become a negative number and we go back to the year 1902, which causes all kinds of problems. And the only fix that really works as we found out a few years earlier, is to make it a 64-bit type, as a couple of other operating systems already do. And that gives us basically to the end of the universe. Um, why do we actually want to do this? There are an awful lot of 32-bit machines out in the world. People are deploying 32-bit machines at a very high rate to this day. We are adding roughly twice the number of 32-bit machines to the ARM kernel compared to 64-bit machines to this date. And it, it's not likely to stop anytime soon. Can I, can I have another show of hands? Who is working on 32-bit products at this, at this moment? That's more than half of everybody here in this room. That's amazing. <laughs> and some of these things have awfully long service lives and or run awfully old kernels. Um, some examples that we do support in the upstream kernel. We have some toys. My kids are playing with Legos from the 70s, and these have been deployed for a couple of years now, starting out with the, uh, what was it? Yeah, I forget the kernel number. It was a kernel from 2010, uh, 2010 I think, initially on that, and that has been updated. Um, we have some very heavy industry stuff that has tiny embedded controllers in them, sometimes with an ARM9 or even older. Um, and we have, in the automotive industry, a lot of uh, products are being deployed still with 32-bit. And obviously, these will all fail unless we do something about them. And some products have even longer service lives than those. Uh, one example of this, and there are lots of examples that most of you are familiar with. You, you work on a product, you start out with a BSP coming from an SOC manufacturer. It already has a kernel that is a few years old. It takes a couple of years before something makes it to the market. Then it's being sold for hopefully a good number of years before you have to replace it for one reason or another. And then on top of that, the customer actually sub expects to use a product for a good number of years. Um, so what we are worried about today is kernels that people will put into production possibly 10 years from now and then run for another 10 or 20 years on top of that. Another unrelated issue is not, even if you're using 64-bit hardware, you may be using 32-bit user space. One example of this is the Raspbian distribution uh, which a lot of hobbyists use. So even if you have a Raspberry Pi 3 that has a 64-bit CPU, you would be running 32-bit user space and have exactly the same problems. And for industrial users, there are still good reasons to have 32-bit user space, which may be memory constraints, or it may be that you lost the source code for something. Um, you don't have a 64-bit compiler, it's not portable code, but it still works, so there's no real reason to update it unless you want to make it run 
beyond 2038. And then we have some more fundamental problems. We have network protocols that embed a 32-bit number with a time. The same thing goes for file systems. And applications may, uh, may save timestamps in arbitrary formats. And a lot of those use 32-bit timestamps. And I, I listed two examples here. The UTMP file is used by glibc to store the login times of the user. Everybody has that. And CPIO is used by the RPM tool, for example, but also the kernel itself for the InnoDramFS. And then we have hardware interfaces, which are almost impossible to fix. A lot of real-time clocks use 32-bit second counters, and we have some code in place to work for those. Um, and then lots of other things that need to know the time in a hardware or in a firmware. You interchange timestamps between the firmware and the kernel, or between firmware and user space, or between hardware and kernel. Any of, any of those combinations where you have an interface that comes with a product that you communicate with, you have an inherent problem. If you're lucky, you can use unsigned seconds and don't have to change anything else. But then at least both sides have to agree that this number is unsigned. Um, that gives you time until the year 2106, which is 136 years since the start of the Unix epoch in 1970. So what have we been doing in the kernel? Um, this is the first patch that I could find to address this topic. One of my colleagues, John Stoltz, sent this patch to create a time 64 t type inside of the kernel. This type is used for the internal timekeeping, so his approach was to start with all the time handling code inside of the kernel and work his way out from there. Um, basically, uh, the, the timekeeping code was done within a year or two, and then we worked to, towards the device drivers and then the user interfaces. I started working actually from the other side, coming up from the, from the system calls, um, which didn't work all that well. We'll get to that. Um, then, once we had the timekeeping interfaces, fixed, we started converting every single device driver which interacted with the timekeeping core. So we did not change the type throughout the kernel. We addressed every single driver individually. Um, and there were, I think at this point, over a thousand patches that we have done to address this just in the kernel. So how do we do this? We have a type named KTimeT, which is only used inside of the kernel. This is now a 64-bit nanosecond counter. It's an opaque type um, that you can convert to other timestamps, and you can just check how much time has elapsed between two of these KTimeT and some other interfaces use it. Um, and that just makes the code work the same way on 64 and 32-bit, and in many times it works much more efficiently and more accurately than using a time T. Using jiffies is a very old method to address this, and um, that simplifies a lot of code, and it's well understood, and it doesn't suffer from any of the other problems that time T has. In some cases, we have to use the time 64 T, um, simply converting the timestamps to a wider type, but I try to avoid that and also the time spec and time val types. So time val is, for those of you who don't know it, it's a type that has a second and a microsecond value. Um, and this was traditionally used on Unix. But inside of the kernel, it's, we all work with nanoseconds instead of microseconds. So you always have to multiply and divide by a thousand. So we got rid of all the time val usage inside of the kernel and used time spec 64, which in turn is a type using 64-bit seconds plus nanoseconds. And another change that we did at the same time was to change a lot of the users of clock real time to clock monotonic. So what's clock, clock monotonic? The main difference is clock real time counts in the UTC time domain starting at 1970. It does not handle leap seconds, which can often become a problem. And clock real time is also the time that the user space sets when you talk to an NTP server or 
you just update the time using the set time or uh, sorry set time of day system call or the real time clock interfaces to copy the time from real time clock into the kernel. Um, that all changes the time. In a lot of cases, inside of the kernel, you want to know how much time has elapsed between two events. So clock real time is a really bad idea for that. It can, in the, in the case of leap seconds, it can sometimes go backwards. When you set the time, it can be all over the place. And clock monotonic doesn't have this problem. It just starts ticking when you boot up the system. One of the harder problems always is the user space interfaces. So when, the, when you have a user space interface, we know that we will have to change both the kernel and user space at the same time in the same way. Uh, and ideally, we want to do it in a way that users don't ever see it. So you just recompile your program, and it should work with a newer kernel. IO control is the most common user interface that you have in a device driver. And here we got a little bit lucky. So we have these fancy macros that are used to define IO control command codes. And they take the size of the argument type. So you, you pass a pointer to a structure, and the size of that structure is used to define the command number that the device driver uses internally. So uh, the parallel port driver was one of the cases where we pass a struct time well. Struct time well, in turn, user space will have to redefine it to be 64-bit based. So we'll have, it will grow from uh, two 32-bit integers to a 64-bit integer, a 32-bit integer, and some padding. So it will be 16 bytes long instead of eight bytes. And that means that this macro evaluates to a different number in user space. We pass that number as a command code into the IO control system call, and the device driver just sees a new command. And then the same goes for, the, for this PPP um, command, which takes a structure, and that structure embeds a time type. The implementation looks like this. We get rid of, we have a big switch case statement that evaluates all the IO control commands that a driver supports, we, and the code that handles the old command gets replaced with two case statements, one for the version that the 32-bit users, that the old 32-bit user space sees, and one for the version that any 64-bit user space or modern 32-bit user space sees. And then this driver just understands both commands. We can, we can use them on both 32-bit and 64-bit kernels, and we don't even have to worry about the compat mode anymore, where you run 32-bit user space on 64-bit kernels and also have a related problem to this. But unfortunately, that's not always possible. So we have some very common IO control commands that date back to much older versions of Linux or even old Unix versions. Um, so if you get a socket timestamp, you receive a packet, you want to know when it arrived, uh, the command code is actually defined as a hexadecimal number that someone came up with. It does not change when you change the type of a time well, even though it passes a time well. Um, and there we have to go through a lot of extra hoops to make it work the same way. So we change the header file, um, and we change it in the way that on 64-bit architectures, we still get the same old command code. Um, and on everything else, we define it to, a, uh, to an expression that contains a ternary operator and either uses the old or the new L control command. And the new command is defined in the proper way as a combination of two 64-bit um, integers. There's a special case for the x86 x32 ABI that basically has no users, but that always gets in the way because they decided to address this problem a number of years ago by making time t 64-bit for their architecture. But now um, 
Well, they don't have any users, but they're making our life harder, unfortunately. So we always have this one special case for those. And I hope that we can eventually get rid of that. Um, it gets worse. Uh, the input event does not use an IO control command at all. So if you want to know the timestamp of the clicker or how fast someone's moving over the trackpad, um, you get the same kind of timestamp in a data structure, but you get it through the read system call. And the read system call, we have no way of finding out whether the user space has been built with an old glibc or a new glibc, so we don't know which type of time information it uses. The only way we can make this work at all is by keeping the use of a 32-bit um, time type and making sure that the users don't notice it. Um, so in the header file, we redefined the input event structure to not contain a time spec anymore, but instead have a similar structure that has 32-bit seconds and 32-bit nanoseconds. Um, do I have a? Yes, there it is. Um, so on 32-bit, we use this type, which again is a special hack for X32. And then we have to make sure that the timestamps that are passed through this are always done in terms of clock monotonic and not clock real time. This is something that we have to add some checking for. Right now you can choose between the, t the types of timestamps. If you use clock real time, it will keep working, but it, will, it, it may or may not cause problems in 2038, depending on how you interpret those timestamps. If you're using clock monotonic, it works just fine. And then you have every application that uses this structure has to include the new header file. If you copy the header file into an application, which some people do, then it will break. And it will just not work once you upgrade to glibc. And a similar problem exists in some drivers. Uh, I know of two examples where we have a time information in a data structure that is exported from the kernel to user space using a memory mapped interface. Um, the most, common, most commonly used one is the PCM interface in ALSA, in the sound drivers. Um, and, oh, sorry. Uh, and there, we just had a discussion on Sunday about this. We've had patches for at least a year and we've talked about it for longer. We still have to make the final decision which way we do it. We can, make, we can change the kernel to detect which interfaces the user space expects and then export one ABI or the other. Or we can keep the ABI like we did for the input event and change all of user space to not expect 64-bit timestamps, so change all the types that are visible in user space headers, and also make sure that the user space uses clock monotonic, which you normally want anyway for audio, but we're not currently forcing users to use clock monotonic. The biggest issue so far has been the virtual file system. The main reason is that we have this large number of, device, uh, of, of file system implementations I think there are over 40 or 50 of them in the kernel. And the fundamental structure that they use is the inode. The inode contains a couple of timestamps. The timestamp is the A time, M time, C time, usually. We also added uh, B time, that's the birth time or creation time of a file in the meantime. Um, and I worked on this as the very first thing when I started looking at this. I think it was 2012 posted patches in 2014. Um, Deepa took over uh, and did another version from scratch on the same patches. She, she posted it in 2016 as part of her outreachy internship, which seemed like a good idea at the time. It turns out she's still working with me on these, but she has managed to get it done after five more rewrites of this patch set. Um, Another piece of the puzzle was the StatX system call, 
So we have over a dozen different implementations of the STAT system call in the kernel. We have an architecture-specific structure for STAT, and we have, on some architectures, three or four different binary layouts of STAT, which is crazy. And then we also have LSTAT and FSTAT and FSTAT at and all, this, all, all those combinations. The STATX system call just replaces all of them. So any new architecture that we're adding in the future will only implement STATX. And then glibc can implement all the other ones based on that. Um, for U times, I think we've just done that. Uh, but I'm not sure, I have to check. Um, it will be on a later slide. And then the file systems themselves. So this, this, the work that Deepa did was for the core file system code, which sits between the system calls and the file system implementation. So we made that 64-bit. But some file systems, either in the code, are still using 32-bit, or on disk, or on the network, whatever file systems use, um, they store the timestamps permanently as 32-bits. So for example, XFS, we know how to fix it, but we haven't done it yet. Uh, NFS, the code is still wrong. We have to fix that. And for NFS v3, I think it's fundamentally 32-bit. And NFS v4 uses 64-bit timestamps already. So we just need to get the ABI in between right, uh, the, the API. Um, and then a couple more. And um, ext3, for example, is similar to NFS v3 that will never be fixed. So if you're using ext3 at the moment, uh, Stop doing that, use ext4 because that has the fixes. Um, the system calls, that's the, the most obvious thing. The, there's the advantage that it's only between the kernel and user space typically. We found around 50 system calls that pass time information in some form. And in 4.18, we had 50% done. In 4.19, um, I think we didn't get any, but for 4.20, we, we now have another set of system calls. So we get it to maybe 75% of the system calls that have a correct implementation in the kernel, but no architecture is currently using those. The idea is that we change all the architectures at the same time. Every single 32-bit architecture will start using those entry points once we have done them all. And at that point, you can start building a glibc or whichever libc implementation you use to call those system calls. And there's still a couple of them. We basically just agreed on how to, how to do uh, the adjust timex, which, um, sorry, clock adjust time and adjust timex. Uh, and then there are these four system calls that use special data structures. I'm still in the discussion with a number of people. Unfortunately, the main problem here is that nobody really has an opinion. We know there are at least four different ways of how to address those that are all slightly different and may have downsides and upsides. Um, but nobody really has put their foot down and said, well, don't use that, use that. And um, I'm sort of on, on the fence between two different ways. Um, let me get to how we do it. Turns out we already have, for each of the system calls that we need to address, two implementations in the kernel. We have one that is used natively, and we have one that is used for 32-bit processes on a 64-bit architecture. For each of those, because they all have the problem that they pass a 32-bit time t. Um, so taking this Futex system call, you have a 32-bit system that has a native 32-bit Futex passing a time spec. Then you have a 64-bit system that has almost the same system calls implemented by the same source code, but struct time spec is defined differently. So this looks slightly differently to you, uh, at, at the ABI level, even though the source code is the same. And we added a compat version, compat sysfutex, just implements the same ABI that sysfutex implements on 32-bit architecture, so we can use this to run a 32-bit 
user space application that calls Futex. Um, what our patches did was to add, to, to just enable that compats with Futex on a 32-bit architecture. So now we have two system calls that implement the exact same ABI. Uh, this is what the patch looked like for this. So instead of guarding it by config compat, which is only uh, enabled on 64-bit architectures, change it to a com config compat 32-bit time. Um, and this symbol can now be enabled if you have either config compat set or you are running on a 32-bit architecture. And at that point, this becomes available. And then we have to uh, change the type. So instead of config, uh, compat timestamp, uh, con sorry, compat time spec, we now use an old time spec 32, which is the name for the structure that 32-bit tasks use for time spec. And the final step was based on feedback from Christoph Helwig just in the past few months. Um, let's just rename that system call as well once we're there so we don't have the compat name on 32-bit architectures. The code is still the same and we use the sysfutex time32 on both 32-bit and 64-bit architectures and this still implements the same ABI as this one and the final step is um, to change over the native sysfutex system call on a 32-bit architecture to look exactly like the sysfutex on a 64-bit architecture. And at that point, we have two implementations of the system call that no longer differ between the type of architecture you have. Uh, you just use the old system call number to jump into this function and, the, and we assign a new system call number to jump into the old, uh, the old version, which now implements the new ABI. Um, we also get a new type for this. So a kernel time spec is now the structure that is used on the interface between the kernel and user space and nowhere else. We don't use it in the kernel. We don't use it in user space. We use it only at the boundary. Um, there, there's a reason for that. Um, to do this changeover, we already have this patch in the kernel. So kernel time spec is now used on 32-bit architecture, but we still don't, haven't changed the system call tables. So this gets redefined to, to the old time spec until we change the system call table. When we change the system call table, this code will just go away. We will use the new definition of the structure, and then life will be good. Then we have everything the way it should have been done 20 years ago. This is the, number of the, the list of all the system calls that already have replacement in the kernel for, some, for one reason or, an, or another. So the time system call tells you the time in seconds. The get time of day tells you the time in seconds and microseconds. And we have another system call called clock get time that tells you the time in seconds and nanoseconds. So we just need to replace clock get time with the clock get time 64. Then we have four different versions of this system call. But the older ones we don't have to replace because glibc can just implement time and get time of day by calling clock get time 64. And the same goes for all the other ones here. These are the ones that are fixed in 4.18. These are the ones that we have patches for that unfortunately did not quite make it into, the, into what will become 4.20. So I, I'm fairly sure that in 4.21, these are all good to go. The patches are reviewed. It was just the bad timing that made me not able to, to submit them in time. Um, these are the, all the system calls that do need a replacement. So for each of these, the current version, there, there is not already a replacement system call in the kernel and we pass a 32-bit time t. And again, about half of these are done already in 4.18 and 4.19. Um, we have a couple more uh, that have patches ready and that gets us to the 
get itimer set itimer got our usage weight id oh and this info we don't do actually so get our usage as the example this structure is defined on every unix system it's always defined the same way we have a time well in here the time well tells us how much time has elapsed while running this process and that the same thing for user time and system time. The same structure is used for wait for, wait ID, and get our usage in Linux. Um, and there are multiple ways of doing this. So one way is to basically just say, if we are in the kernel, or we're running a 32-bit, uh, where am I? Um, so, right, so we just define it to kernel old time well, so that when you in include the kernel header, you see a structure definition that matches the old binary interface. And that's important because struct time well is getting redefined by glibc. So if you use a new glibc, include the kernel header that defines the structure, and then call the old system call, it doesn't work because all the, f all the fields after this are in the wrong place, and these fields don't tell you the right time. Um, and then glibc can, on top of that, implement the same structure and copy between those. That's the easiest way. We don't have to actually do anything in the kernel. We just have to change the kernel header file. Um, another option would be to get rid of the time well and put a time spec in, because we, don't, we, we actually really hate time well in the kernel. Um, so time, time spec would be the correct thing to do here. And um, this still keeps all the other members the same. So these would be long. We could also make them 64-bit, which is another version of this. Um, and then glibc still has to convert between it, because now it has to divide by 1,000 to get from time spec to time well. But it's a nice interface. And that's, those are the main options that we have for addressing this. And I'm sort of leaning towards not doing anything in the kernel and letting glibc take care of it, which is a bit ugly because 20 years from now, everybody will wonder, so what's, what's this strange structure do, doing here and why do we pass 32-bit seconds where everything else uses 64-bit seconds? Um, and there's a problem with the time spec definition, which is really interesting. Uh, so the C99 standard actually defines what the time spec looks like, and it says, there's a member called TVSEC that is a, um, time, uh, a time T. In the kernel, we would use time 64 T with underscore so it doesn't conflict with any user space definition. Um, oh, this is actually the glibc definition, yes. So the internal glibc definition has a 64 bit TVSEC member, and this is fine. Uh, the kernel uses 64 bit nanoseconds at the interface. But C99 and POSIX both say that the nanoseconds have to be long, which is always 32-bit wide in user space. And this is sort of okay on x86 because it's little endian, and you just get more padding at the end. Um, the reason why we want to use 64-bit on the kernel interface is to make sure that this padding is always zero filled. If we had implied padding, um, by just having two members here, 64-bit member and a 32-bit member, the ABI would add four more bytes. If you fill the first two members and then do a mem copy from kernel to user space, you get four bytes of kernel stack data, which can be used potentially in a, an exploit by finding out information that user space should not have, but that is available in the kernel. And this is a real problem. Um, and then user space needs to make sure we match the layout. So on a little, little endian architecture, did I get this the wrong way? Um, so we either have to add padding in the end, or we have to add padding before it. So if we add the padding in the end, we actually can call it padding. If we add the padding before it, we have another problem, which is if you initialize a time spec that you want to pass to kernel space by, 
using C code to just set the first and the second member, you really want the second member to be the one that is the nanoseconds. You don't want it to be the padding, so you have to use a bit field, which is another way of doing this. So this is really ugly already. But as always, it gets worse. <laughs> um, oh yes, and I had this time valve. Well. And I really only found, about, found out about this a month or two ago. There's one architecture in the kernel that defines time well differently from everybody else, and that's Spark 64. On Spark 64, we have a 32-bit microseconds value on a 64-bit architecture, whereas all other 64-bit architectures have a 64-bit microseconds value. And that means it's currently broken already because we again pass kernel stack data to user space, as I just explained. Um, if we replace it with a 64-bit member, copying it out, since Spark is a big Indian architecture, we copied the wrong bytes. And I already introduced a bug in some code that I really have to fix now. Um, and I didn't manage to send some other patches where I would have broken a lot more important code. So the, the parallel port driver, fortunately, is not used much on Spark 64. And in <laughs> practice. Um, but I have to go through all the, all the interfaces again that use a time well on the user space uh, to make sure that I'm not breaking any, either of the two Spark 64 users. Um, so what's coming up? So this was all about the kernel so far. Um, the next step obviously is glibc or any other libc implementation. We have two libc implementations that have some sort of code working. Albia Aribo has um, spent a long time designing the interfaces for glibc. They've had some surprising, as I found, decisions in there. One thing is that they actually want to run uh, user space with the 64-bit time t on older kernels that did not have the 64-bit time t system calls. They also want to make sure that you can basically indefinitely build user space using either 32-bit time t or 64-bit time t, depending on the macro that you set, just like we do for uh, long offsets in files. So we pass um, a macro definition to the compiler. You can set it in a header file, you can pass it to the command line. If you do this, you get the 64-bit time t once those patches have been merged. If you don't do it, you get the old interfaces. And then you have to build everything else on top of the glibc. Um, if it passes a time, time structure from one library to something else, then you have to make sure it matches, or you also have to use symbol versioning and make sure that you build it the right way. Um, I did a prototype of another libc uh, called Muzzle that is used by a number of people. Um, if anybody is interested in seeing the code, I have it available, but the version that I did will actually not make it into Muzzle itself because I made it configurable. Um, so at the time when you build Muzzle, the way I did it, you build it either with a 32-bit or 64-bit time t, and then user space will match that. Um, this is not what's going to happen in Muzzle because they decided to rework their user space ABI from ground up and fix everything that has bothered them in a, in a while. So there will be a muzzle 2 at some point in the future, which will have 64-bit time t only, and also fix a few other things. Um, and then we have to see how we can deploy that, because that will only work on newer kernels. Um, then there's, after we have the libc, we have to worry about the distros. The easiest case are the embedded distros. So if you are working with Open Embedded or any of the other ones that build everything from source, you are lucky. <laughs> because uh, you can just rebuild everything with a 64-bit time t flag set, and then you have to worry about how to deploy all your user space binaries in the field at the same time without breaking anything. Um, which is also interesting. But it's much easier than having to worry about a gradual upgrade strategy. So Android is probably in the worst situation because 
They have ABI levels, they support old 32-bit apps on all their Androids, uh, including 64-bit Android. So they are definitely in this position where it matters a lot to them. Um, I don't know how they, will, how they will solve it. They might just uh, drop 32-bit app support, but right now almost all the apps that you see, like the, the, the most used apps, all rely on 32-bit ARM binary interfaces and they will all change. So none of the 32-bit apps, if you deploy them in the field, they are almost certainly going to be broken. You will have to recompile them to a new ABI. And then there's a desktop. 64-bit desktops, we basically only have to worry about bugs. So if you're running XFS, uh, you will have to upgrade to a newer kernel that supports future timestamps in XFS. And that's it. Then, and if you have applications that have bugs, you will have to update those applications. And that's all easy. 32-bit distros, for a lot of those, the plan is that they will go away. So if you, if you have an embedded system that happens to rely on a Debian instead of Open Embedded or OpenSUSE or Fedora or Ubuntu or any of the others, um, they will, by 2038, be out of long gone, probably. Um, but you might still be using them because for your product it, doesn't, it happens to not have any communication interfaces, maybe. And you think it doesn't matter, but then if you have a real-time clock, it does matter. Um, these are the, architect, the, the distros that I could find easily that have support for 32-bit user space today. Out of these, almost all of, the, all of them are on their way out or will go away in the near future. These are the ones that probably matter for a long time longer. Um, everything that has an ARMv7 port at the moment has a good chance of having someone deploy this distro in some embedded device or in some, some low-end um, desktop machine somewhere. Um, so those are the ones we worry about, all the Raspberry Pis and all the industrial embedded stuff. Uh, Debian is probably going to be the only one with an x86 port that will matter in, in 2038. Even if they stop supporting x86 at the time, there will still be users somewhere. Um, and this is roughly my progress. The driver code, as I said, that was hundreds and hundreds of patches that is mostly done. We basically have patches for all the drivers. We're still lacking patches for a couple of the subsystems, so video for Linux, ALSA, and, if, and sockets, they're the big ones where we are working on uh, fixing the, the user space interfaces still, but the individual device drivers are usually fine. Um, the core timer handling, the only thing that's missing is removing the interfaces that are still used by one or two remaining drivers for which the maintainer has not picked up my patches yet. System calls, as I said, we have a couple of system calls that have patches that we hope to get into 4.21. And for some of them, we still have to decide on how we do it. File systems, there's still some cleanup work and some development work for a couple of them. Most of them are already perfect. And then the architecture-specific code, I have um, one colleague who is working on reworking the way we handle system call tables uh, fundamentally. So it's, at the moment we have about half the architectures using the same system call table in ASM generic. That's something, something I worked on at least 10 years ago, pro probably longer. So all the new architectures are fine. They only have one table. Um, but then we have 10 to 12 different architects that each have a completely separate system call table. Not only the contents differ, but also the way that the system call table looks like when you look at the source code. And it's very hard to find out which architecture actually implements which system calls. So we're fixing that first. Once we have that done, we just add all the system calls that are missing to make sure that each architecture has all the support in the same kernel version 
in order to make it easier for the libc people and that, that they can set a minimum kernel version say if you have to, uh, a linux 4.22 kernel it will work so that's there's still some something going on there for the c library it depends a lot on which library you use and the distros for debian we've had some long conversations about migration plans other distros were just convinced to drop their 32 bit support sooner um, but it's still very much open what's going to happen there. And that's it from me. Yes, uh, you have a microphone there. Uh, I have a question. Uh, how do you test uh, such changes that you do? And more generic question, is there any test you that can say this part or this part of your operation system behaves incorrectly, so you have to look at it? So for the most part, we try to make it so that the changes we do are automatically part of what people use. Um, so that the, re the general testing, well, we, we haven't actually started testing much. So in the kernel, I try to make sure not to change um, things that I don't see testing. But uh, yes, if you have a system, the only real thing that you can do is set the time to 2039 and see what happens. Um, the other thing that we did is to try to make it possible to disable all the 32-bit interfaces. So if you don't have the old system calls anymore, they're completely removed, you run your user space today, and it tries to call one of the system calls, it fails immediately, which is much better than failing in the future. Okay. Have you considered using uh, kernel personality? to implement uh, the choice of whether doing 32-bit or 64-bit timestamps? We, we thought about this right at the beginning and decided not to do it um, because it would basically end up meaning that we introduce a completely new binary interface, um, which is sort of the opposite of what we're trying to do because all of this is just for compatibility with old systems. And if we break in compatibility, then that's this. Oh. <laughs> Since we failed, yes. Uh, what about user space applications? Uh, if any application copies a time team into a long, yes, that's broken. It also dies. Yes, that's that's definitely broken. There will be a lot of applications that are broken, and there's not much we can do. We can we can fix a lot of the open source applications when we get there. When we rebuild Debian, we will find those problems. If you have an in-house application, of course, if you have a bug. That's no different from porting from big endian to little endian from porting from 32 to 64 bit. You will have bugs. You say you will find those problems? You will find them in 2038. No. If, um, yes. <laughs> yes. You, it's up to, if, you, if it's your application and your bug, you will have to fix it. It's, you will have to find it. We, we, we thought about having some way to make it easier, but we haven't actually done any of that. Uh, one more question. Uh, do we need to really care about 32-bit platform distributions except uh, embedded stuff? I don't know. <laughs> I'm just trying to fix the kernel. So be because, for example, in your slide you miss that Chrome OS. I guess Chrome OS never was 32-bit, right? Sorry, Chrome OS? Yeah, Chrome OS from Google. Um, well, the, cr the last 32-bit Chrome OS devices are going out of service very soon, so, uh, and they're all based on EMMC, which dies long before that, so I don't, I'm not worried about those. <laughs> um. Do you know from everyone, uh, anyone who is trying to fix user space only? So a new libc which could handle an old kernel? Um, that would not work, because the kernel will just still crash. Thank you. <laughs> okay. Thank you.